Hello, folks, and thank you all so much uh, for coming out for this first live, uh, uh, first of the live Q and A's for our spring season of Curious Minds, presented by Hollywood Suite. Uh, over the next couple hours, we are going to be checking in with uh, the four wonderful lecturers uh, who are leading our spring series uh, for a series of 20 minute Q and A's in which they are going to be answering some of the great questions that you have submitted to us this week uh, in response to our first round of lectures. Um, and we're delighted to kick things off right now with one of our most beloved lecturers uh, here at Curious Minds, the one and only Dr. Mike Daly, who's of course leading our series on the folk music revival of the 1950s and 60s. Uh, Mike and I were both very impressed by both the the quantity and the quality of the great questions uh, you submitted to us uh, throughout this week. Uh, and we really hope you'll keep them coming uh, over the next six weeks. Uh, before we begin, I just want to quickly mention to all of you who, who may be sticking later Q and A's uh, this, this morning, including our Q and A at 10.30 with Peter Harris. Uh, please remember once we've wrapped up with Mike to uh, refresh your browser. You'll need to refresh your browser at 10.30 to, law, to uh, take part in the next Q and A at 10.30. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, it is as always an honor and a privilege to hand our virtual stage over to Mike so we can tackle your great questions. Please join me from the comfort of your homes in raising a, a warm beverage uh, to uh, one of Canada's greatest popular music scholars, Dr. Mike Daly. Thank you, Will. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, now, you might be hearing some music, and I just want to tell you that uh, that is my wife, Jill, and she is playing downstairs. Um, for a ballet class, a live ballet class that's going out uh, actually all over the world to students of the National Ballet School. So the National Ballet School, of course, uh, closed, but uh, still doing classes with students. And so uh, the kids are uh, doing their plies uh, to Jill's music as we speak, and they're working with two teachers. So you may hear music from time to time, such as right now. So uh, some great questions and uh, I'll get right to them. Dean writes, it seems like John Lomax has been accused by some critics of a certain degree of paternalism towards the African-American music musicians he recorded. Do you think that is a fair criticism? Well, uh, John Lomax was a product of his place and time. And uh, growing up in Texas around uh, the turn of the century, he was invested in the existing status quo as far as the hierarchy on the basis of uh, whether people were African American or European American. And he, to that extent, he accepted uh, the system and he didn't Unlike his son, Alan, who was far more of an activist and even even um, uh, uh, more in radical politics, as far as being on the on the cutting edge of uh, especially white attitudes towards civil rights, white American attitudes towards civil rights, say in the 30s and 40s, John Lomax was not in that way. And so while he believed in the in the value of black folk arts, uh, such as the you know the the work of uh, Hoodie Ledbetter, Led Belly, who uh, he, uh, John and Alan discovered in the prison. Uh, he did not f feel that there was a need to overturn existing structures, and so there was that political strong political difference between father and son. And Alan, as I say, was had a very very different attitude, despite also uh, growing up in Texas, but at a, at a time when uh, different ideas were in the air. So there is a, an oft um, repeated misconception about John Lomax that's seen as being emblematic of his, of his attitude. And that is that he uh, 
when he was touring with Lead Belly that he made Lead Belly dress up in overalls to perform. And that is not true. And that is a um, that is a misconception that has come from the fact that there do exist uh, photographs, publicity photographs that were taken of Lead Belly in the overalls sitting on bales of hay and so on. So that was a way of uh, marketing him as a you know, rustic singer. And um, that, you know, those type, that type of imagery and that type of presentation was actually very common in the music business of the 20s and 30s in the United States. Uh, and the, the, the sort of unironic uh, uh, embrace of stereotypes to sell records. And there was no, there was no sense of this is undignified or this is, you know, oh, there's the music again. Uh, so yes, there, I think some of those criticisms are true, definitely of John Lomax. Now also about speaking of Lead Belly um, and Sergeant writes in your research about Lead Belly, given how many times he was arrested and imprisoned, did you find any evidence of racial bias or trumped up charges, or did he really commit all the crimes leading to his incarcerations? I've, I haven't seen in my reading, now I haven't done a specialized study of Lead Belly, but uh, I have never seen in my reading uh, any uh, accusations of there being trumped up charges. Uh, in the case of Lead Belly. Certainly trumped up charges for African Americans were common in those days. What I found, you know, I did, I have done some uh, extensive research on an African American uh, female prisoner named Maddie Mae Thomas, who recorded it in 1939. She was, at, she was um, sentenced for murder in the early 30s and she was in parchment farm in mississippi and it that doesn't doesn't seem to have been a trumped up charge either but um there the trial was a one day trial you know for a murder trial with with supposedly life imprisonment but um what i what i've also found is that there was a kind of porousness in the southern prison system where uh, with good behavior and uh, or maybe if if the governor took a liking to you uh, there was a lot of early release there was a lot of um, uh, parole so it's a it's a funny system in that way um, but in the case of lead belly he seems to as far as i can tell the charges seem to have been genuine all right Elaine Goldbach writes, how does black folk music differ from black spiritual music? I would characterize black spiritual music as being a subset of the umbrella term black folk music. Folk music is probably best thought of more as a format than a genre. And let me explain what I mean. Uh, a genre has to do with um, uh, specific stylistic characteristics or uh, functions, whereas a format is kind of a catch-all, uh, like in the way that, say, uh, easy listening is a format, or um, what's another clear format? R&B, rhythm and blues. You know, it's a it's a sort of catch-all for a bunch of different styles, and within that format, different styles can come and go. So anyway. Folk music is a descriptor. Now, again, folk music, as I've tried to show in the first lecture, is a is a tricky term, and it is one that is uh, often misused. So there is the definition that I gave from the Harvard Dictionary of Music right at the top, where I said folk music is uh, traditional, it's oral, it's amateur musicians, it's past. Um, through uh, direct transmission, that is by hearing somebody sing or play and then imitating it by ear. That's how the music is disseminated. And so in that sense, spirituals, that is um, uh, religious songs that were, uh, that were not necessarily composed by professional composers and published as sheet music, uh, 
so spiritual is like, you know, I shall not be moved, right? Where it's a, a clearly, it's a repetitive form. It's a call and response. It's the idea behind a, a spiritual, like I shall not be moved or uh, we shall overcome, which was originally we will overcome, is that these were uh, sp these were religious songs that could be taught orally in a church service and not read from hymn books. So they have a large degree of repetition. Often they use ver vernacular language. And so uh, spirituals um, of that type very much fit in to the folk format. That said, the way that many spirituals were heard in the mainstream, such as were performed by uh, professional, semi-professional groups like the Fisk uh, Jubilee Singers, those were uh, folk spirituals that were then written down and formally arranged and sometimes embellished so as to be um, more uh, professional, more presentable in a um, public theater setting. And so what often happens, and this is what happened with folk music as well, is that you've got things that are sort of circulating in the oral tradition, and then they are taken and they are formalized, they are codified, and they are published, and you know, people who read music uh, sing them. So that's what happens with spirituals. So spirituals have this, it's the same thing that happened with blues, right? Blues starts out as absolute oral, traditional folk music, absolutely amateur. And then it, the, when it bec becomes commodified is when it is, you know, written down, when it is performed in, uh, uh, for a paying audience. And so, and anyway, as we'll see when we get into the 50s and the 60s, the definition of folk uh, really gets kind of perverted, right? It, be, it becomes um, a descriptor for, for absolutely professional musicians doing, uh, disseminating music on recordings and on television and on radio, you know, through electronic means. That's not the oral tradition. Uh, and yet we call it folk music because it is stylistically related to that earlier true folk music that I'm trying to lay the groundwork uh, with with these first couple of lectures. So uh, kind of a convoluted answer to your question, but I hope that um, clears up at least the difference that the short answer is uh, spirituals are a subset of black folk music, which also includes, um, you know, fiddle music, uh, ring shouts, work songs, blues in its earliest form. Um, uh, you know, oral poetry, all kinds of expressions. Okay, David writes, I know that much has been made of the so-called Scotch-Irish emigration to the States in the American South. Yeah, I wouldn't even say so-called, I'd say actual. Uh, and German and uh, Swiss and all kinds of other groups in waves. And the ways that their folk waves have shaped the culture we now associate with the, with the region. Do you hear lots of Scottish and Irish folk music or folk elements in the folk forms that we now consider authentically American? Absolutely. I think that um, if you look especially at the dance music traditions of, you know, of rural folk music that are being recorded and so on in the, um, uh, in the early 20s and 1930s, the fiddling, the jigs, the reels, same with Canada. Um, that, uh, you know, the East Coast traditions are absolutely uh, influenced in Canada. We also have the French um, musical traditions, which are also influenced by the Irish fiddling traditions. Um, but it's, you know, it's always in a mix, right? So I mentioned the German and the Swiss that brings in the yodeling that, that you'll hear in the second uh, lecture. Um, and uh, lots of and of course the african influences that change all of these things as well the amazing thing that happens in the uh, in north america is that these traditions are syncretic that is they mix together very well they mesh and they create something that um, creates that has you know i'm talking about the european 
um, and the African musical aesthetics, the way that they mesh creates something beautiful that, that really works and propagates and creates something that's uniquely uh, American, really. And uh, that doesn't always happen, right? Uh, you don't always have musical traditions that are able to intertwine and mix and overlap and, uh, and combine and recombine in that way. So, for example, that's why you don't see a whole lot of mixing of uh, Native American musical traditions and uh, European traditions, um, it, at least not in the uh, first centuries of contact that the, the styles of music were too different. They came from too different a place aesthetically to really meld and mix the way that African and European uh, traditions that had previously been rather separate did. Jill Pomerantz writes, in the musical Showboat, there are two songs, Old Man River and Can't Help Lovin' That Dat Man of Mine. Uh, that sounds like that sound like they are written in the folk ballads tradition. Am I cor correct that they are written in that tradition? And if yes, were they based on actual folk songs or newly written in that style? They were newly written uh, to try to capture African American folk styles by Jerome Kern. And uh, you know, lots of um, uh, white American composers were trying to write in African American idioms in the early years of the 20th century and let's face it still are um, so you and you know the way that they would do this is by trying to adopt uh, syncopated rhythm for example you see Irving Berlin uh, trying to incorporate ragtime syncopated rhythm in songs like Alexander's Ragtime Band from 1911 Jerome Kern was very very good at uh, trying to assimilate George Gershwin is another who was able to absorb the stylistic idioms you know uh, incorporating as I mentioned syncopation as well you look at a song like Old Man River it's based on a pentatonic scale a five note scale da, 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 da. that's six notes but I had the top note there and so you know he's trying to get that folk sound and so um, that would be uh, you know, simulated folk style. And then in the 50s, you have writers like Merle Travis, who are trying to write songs that f sound like folk songs, songs like uh, 16 Tons. Sounds like a folk song? No, it's a newly written song, commercially written uh, song. Okay, and just quickly, um, last question. Phil Aber writes, even following the folk song revival of the 50s, do you see any current interest in the general population in traditional folk songs, or is it mainly an academic interest? Well, not as much as there was during the folk boom, but there are still uh, people who are interested in these songs, who are, who are singing them and playing them in a living tradition. It's a minority, but it exists. And there's also, of course, a huge folklore academic uh, group as well. But definitely the peak, I'd say, was the 50s and 60s when people were really uh, tapping into these songs and playing them out in venues for the public on a regular basis. The songwriting model has very much taken over the traditional model since the 60s. All right, we're at 1020, so I think there's Will DeNovi. Yeah, so thank you so much, Mike, uh, for sharing all those in, uh, insights with us. And um, just a reminder to our, our folks at home that we will be uh, we'll be back next Friday uh, at 10 a.m. with another round of uh, another Q&A in response to our uh, second lecture, which will be posted on Monday. Uh, I am in the privileged position of getting a sneak peek of these lectures before, before they go live. And let me tell you, folks, uh, lecture two is going to be really uh, interesting and exciting. Mike digs uh, into some of the emerging country music stars uh, of the 20s and 30s, as well as the uh, the great folk music of the labor movement of the 30s. So lots of goodies uh, to look forward to. Uh, so I want to thank you all for coming out. And I want to extend a special thanks to you, Mike, uh, for joining us My on pleasure. this fine Friday morning. Have a wonderful weekend. You too. And have a great weekend, everyone.